Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Schiller. I'm a professor of political science and public policy uh, and the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University. Today is the fourth panel in our series co-hosted by the University of Connecticut Arms Center and Brown University's Taubman Center. Uh, the panel series is entitled Bearing the Burden, and it focuses on the disproportionate impact of gun violence on women. Today's panel is being recorded and live streamed, and it will be reposted on social media and other outlets. Each of our previous panels can be found on YouTube at the Yukon in ship site or through our Twitter links, arms um, at arms underscore GVP underscore RIG and the Taubman Center at Taubman CTR. And we will put these links in the chat for everybody to access. My co-organizers for today's event are Professor Jennifer Deneen of the University of Connecticut, Carrie Ressian of the University of Connecticut, and Caitlin Sidorsky of Coastal Carolina University. Our thanks to Melanie Skolnick, Josh Harden, Haley Troy, and Michaela Carey for all their fantastic technical uh, support. It is our hope with this entire series and today's panel to bring together scholars, advocates, and practitioners to focus on multiple dimensions of women and domestic gun violence with the ultimate goal of helping to reduce the human costs associated with it. Each of our panelists today will speak for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, which you can put directly in the chat or raise your hand to speak directly uh, during the forum. I will get the conversation started with a question for each of our panelists. The order of presentation will be Dr. Alexandra Falindra, Associate Professor of Political Science and Psychology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She publishes work on American gun politics, immigration policy, race and ethnic politics, public opinion, and political psychology. Next will be Dr. Shannon Frateroli, Professor of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and a faculty member of the Johns Hopkins University Center for Gun Violence Solutions. She specializes in the study of injury prevention, opioid use, gun violence, and extreme risk protection orders, and public health advocacy. Our, our final speaker, Dr. Ava Carceri, is the director of uh, special court programs for Delaware Family Court. She has held several positions, including data analyst, domestic violence coordinator, and her current role as director of special programs. Her research is primarily focused on civil protection orders and procedural justice for litigants. So we're gonna start our presentation with Dr. Philindra. Thank you, Wendy. I am uh, very excited to be here. Um, and participating in uh, this uh, this panel and in, in this series of discussions, um, the the problem that the panel and the um, the conference itself has focused on for the most part has been the issue of uh, violence against women. Uh, but I would like to bring the problem a bit broader and discuss a little bit about the implications of the new uh, regime of uh, about guns that we have developed in the United States in recent years. Uh, and let me figure out how to do full screen. There we go. Okay. So, and I'll talk about the implications of a political right to arms and the new laws that allow public carry, uh, which have been combined with a, a deregulation uh, at the state level of, uh, of gun ownership um, to a great extent. So where we are is that Heller located the right to be armed in the home. And, but at the same time, the decision recognized both a social right to self-defense and a political right to arms as a way to defend against a tyrannical government. So according to Heller, when the able-bodied men of a nation are trained in arms and organized, they're better able to resist tyranny. So there is uh, a broader uh, right, individual right to arms that involves political um expressions of this right. In Bruin, we have extended the right to be armed into the public square, uh, bringing firearms outside of the home to our parks, 
to our city ca city halls and capitals and political spaces. Um, and tied regulations exclusively to tradition and history. Specifically, Justice Thomas tells us that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to possess and carry weapons in cases of confrontation. And since these confrontations can take out, uh, place outside the home, uh, then that right extends outside the home. Uh, and then Justice Alito tells us that Statistics on crime and mass shootings and accidents are not relevant when uh, we're considering gun regulations. Only the nation's history and the nation's tradition are uh, relevant in such decisions. So this has this new regime um, has created a whole host of new questions um, about how is the public going to react. So we have a new landscape. One problem has to do with chilling effects on social interactions. Are, is the presence of firearms in the public domain, in parks, in uh, open air markets, going to affect how Americans interact with each other and whether they avail of these public spaces? Uh, of even going to the supermarket um, can be a concern when uh, and if uh, arms are allowed in uh, in such spaces where people congregate. Uh, can this have also chilling effects on political participation, on voting, um, on dropping off your ballot at a ballot box? And are we seeing or are we moving towards an era where political vigilantism and forms of intimidation and violence against elected officials um, are going to be part of our lives or an even bigger part of our lives than, uh, than they have been in recent decades. So when we're talking about chilling effects, uh, we're talking about people's unwillingness to visit public spaces, both social and political, because of the potential presence of firearms in these places. Um, we did a study to try to understand whether um, the presence of firearms, when you're invoking the fact that uh, people may be armed in a public place, could produce this type of chilling effect. So we used a series of experiments, of uh, framing experiments, to do so, where um, we had a sample of 2,500 people. We split them into two groups. One group got the uh, control condition, which did not mention firearms, and the other group got the firearms condition, which basically included, was identical to the control, except it included a phrase such as, if guns are allowed in public spaces. So in the first experiment, we looked at whether uh, people would recommend to a friend who has children to spend time um, in a public park in the town uh, in, uh, with or without firearms as a, as a prompt. Um, and we did this this way because not everybody has children, not everybody has a family, but people do know others who do have families. And we know that when they um, think about what to recommend to others, they think about what they would want and do. So we expect that this is based on their own preferences. And across the board, what we find is a very strong chilling effect. So when we people, people are told or reminded that firearms may be present or allowed in such a space, we see a 27 percentage uh, point drop in uh, likelihood of recommending uh, local parks to um, a family with children. Um, this extends to men and women, to people of color and to white people, and even to to all to non-gun owners and gun owners. We see this um, chilling effect present even for people who have guns in the household. The second experiment, which is ex very similar, asks about guns in open air markets and farmers markets type of locations where you go shopping. Um, here again, 
in the in the control condition, we see a much higher um, perception that open air markets and farmers markets are safe compared to how people would feel if uh, guns are allowed in open air markets. Um, we see overall, again, a 27% percentage point drop in perception of the of this type of uh, market as safe. Uh, and this extends to men and women, people of color and, uh, and white people. And we see that uh, it's very strong among people who don't own guns, but it's also present in, uh, in a lesser uh, level among gun owners as well. So even they believe that a farmer's market would be less safe if, uh, if people uh, bring guns to this location. Um, we see similar effects when it comes to the expression of First Amendment rights, like in the case of protest. Uh, protests are a difficult um, condition because not everybody likes to go to protests and not everybody um, sort of would participate in protests. So again, we ask people, what if you had a friend who wanted to go to a protest? Would you recommend would you encourage or discourage that person to attend? And would you do so if guns were allowed at protests? Again, even though starting out, people are not comfortable with protests, we still see an overall chilling effect of 13 percentage points, and it persists among men and women, people of color and white people and non-gun owners, and uh, here we don't see a significant effect for gun owners, but it trends in the same direction. Um, in this experiment, we asked, what about if your friend wanted to bring a sign? And we asked this question because bringing a sign to a protest makes you far more visible. So it increases the risk uh, for the participant. Um, of uh, being identified, of being harmed in some way. It makes it uh, makes people less likely to uh, recommend uh, participation in a protest. Even in this very high risk condition, um, we find that the presence of firearms or the potential presence of firearms can have a significant chilling effect of nine percentage points, which again persists um, for uh, women, for men, for uh, minorities and people of color and non-gun owners. And we don't find a significant effect for gun owners in this, uh, in this case. Um, then we, we shifted to the issue of voting and uh, guns in polling places. Many, uh, many states do restrict um, the presence of firearms. In, uh, in polling places, and clearly there's good reason for this. Our uh, study here suggests that even the idea that guns may be allowed in election centers uh, can have a huge depressive effect in political participation. Do you think that, we ask how safe do you think it would be to go and vote in the next presidential election in person? And we see that 80% of people in the uh, control condition think it's very safe uh, to go and vote. But when guns are invoked, um, this drops by 36 percentage points, which is a dramatic shift. If people um, have reason to believe that uh, guns may be present in the vicinity, uh, or if there are uh, armed protests in the area, that could really affect political participation, voting participation. And this is, again, um, something we see across groups, even among uh, people who own guns, who are gun owners. Um, a similar effect we see when we ask, what a, how safe would you feel dropping off your ballot at a ballot collection box uh, in the next presidential election? And what about 
if armed people were allowed to patrol around such a collection box? This is not a hypothetical question. This is what happened in Arizona, where there was a, a court case, in fact, because people were uh, stationed with arms around a, a ballot collection box. And here again, we see a very large chilling effect of 28 percentage points on average that persists across all the groups um, that we look at. In addition to what happens to, to the public in terms of chilling effects, um, the presence of firearms in, uh, in the public domain has also uh, coincided with an increase in political aggression and actual violence in political settings. Um, we have seen uh, group attacks on institutions, such as the January 6th insurrection, um, it, what happened in Michigan during the COVID crisis, threats of violence against elected officials and staff, violence against elected officials and their families, uh, we are seeing a huge increase in racist and sexist um, messaging and uh, communications um, and uh, threats against all kinds of public servants of all types, from uh, election officials to um, the to, to environmental agency people to uh, hospital workers, we are seeing a large number of, uh, of threats and violence against uh, people who are trying to serve the public good. Um, and uh, we have seen several cases of armed intimidation against protesters um, and even assaults and violence. Even uh, we've had deaths as a result of um, uh, armed intimidation against protesters. And uh, what the research so far, including my current research, suggests is that uh, these phenomena have increased exponentially over the past six years. Um, these are data from the U.S. Capitol Police, and it shows the number of um, threats and cases of violence against Congress. And in just 2021, the U.S. Capitol Police alone recorded 9,625 instances of reportable threats um, that are serious enough that have to be reported to police. Um, the report suggests that Republicans and Democrats are targeted equally, but there are some uh, uh, regional differences. The map at the bottom are actually data from Princeton University um, that collects threats against uh, state and local officials that are um, reported in the media. And as you can see, um, there are instances everywhere in uh, the Midwest, in the Northeast, in the West, in the Southwest, in the Southeast. It's, it's a very expansive phenomenon. We have conducted 104 in-depth interviews with uh, state and local elected officials and their staff. And in uh, every case, practically, people have uh, reported to us uh, similar experiences. And what is even more um, uh, Concerning here is that a lot of it is not being reported to authorities. People do not report every instance to authorities, and especially the staff do not report every instance to their bosses. So there is a limitations to what we know. Uh, studies to date show that there are significant psychological effects uh, of these phenomena on people, a PTSD type of, uh, of effects. Um, we also are documenting in our research um, that people may be reluctant to pursue types of policies that could attract these types of behaviors and put them on the spotlight and make them more vulnerable to physical attacks. Um, it also has an effect on people's willingness on elected officials' willingness to directly interact with voters in open spaces. Um, people are shifting away from town hall settings to much more controlled environments. And this can have uh, implications 
for representation because not all people can be invited to these closed space events. Um, we are also documenting chilling effects on candidate recruitment because uh, the prominence of some of these types of attacks are making a lot of people who could be qualified for public office to shy away from running from office because uh, of fear uh, of, uh, of being the target of this type of, uh, of attack. So overall, what we have seen is that the Bruin decision coupled with states' rush to liberalize gun ownership laws, have introduced new dilemmas to American public life. First, people may retreat from public spaces, from parks and open air markets to all other kinds of socializing in the public. Um, these interactions are very important for building social capital and social trust. So by introducing guns in public spaces, we may be weakening the ties that bind us together as Americans, as citizens, as community people. People may also be hesitant to exercise their First Amendment rights to protest because uh, of concerns that armed counter protests may be uh, present. People may also retreat from voting out of fear of, of armed intimidation um, like what happened in uh, Arizona at the ballot box case. Uh, and we may be empowering vigilante, vigilantes, who, which could lead to more political violence with severe implications for representation and for democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander Fillinger from uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago. Our next presenter is Dr. Sh Shannon Fatteroli, um, who's from Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. And uh, I will give the floor over to Dr. Fatteroli. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. I'm gonna bring us um, from the parks and farmers markets um, back into the home and, sort of start, um, start with the focus on partner violence. Uh, my main um, purpose here is to talk about extreme risk protection orders, but I want to start um, the discussion around extreme risk protection orders by going back to the types of policies that they were based on, which is domestic violence protection orders. And partner violence, just to put a little bit of context around it, um, we know that guns make partner violence more deadly. Um, more than 50% of women who are murdered are killed by intimate partners, and most of those homicides occur with guns. So, you know, that's been a longstanding part of partner violence, a longstanding part of um, having guns in the home. Uh, and it means that um, violence in the home is more dangerous and more deadly for women who women and um, people who experience partner violence. But a little bit of good news is, is that we know that there are things that can be done in order to reduce those risks. And for those of you who have been tuned in to this entire webinar series, um, you heard from April Zioli, Dr. April Zioli, early on about the research that she and others have done to demonstrate that when domestic violence restraining order or protection order laws include prohibitions at the state level on the purchase and possession of guns, what we see are statistically significant reductions in intimate partner homicide. And those reductions hold for both intimate partner homicides with guns as well as intimate partner homicides overall. So we know from the research when domestic violence protection order laws include prohibitions on gun purchase and possession, that translates into lives saved when, um, when we talk about partner violence, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing and a powerful tool that we have in addressing the risks associated with violence um, and, and uh, violence in the home. 
So that was really the background for um, what has developed into a a real embrace of extreme risk protection order laws. Um, We know that domestic violence restraining order laws can have an impact on um, the survival of people in intimate partner relationships. We know that removing guns from people, temporarily removing guns when people are behaving dangerously and at risk of committing violence makes a difference with regard to the safety of people who experience violence. So extreme risk protection orders are really an expansion of domestic violence restraining orders and were really motivated by the evidence that we have around domestic violence restraining orders. I will say that um, I want to just take a couple minutes to walk through um, the process of what an extreme risk protection order is, um, how it's used in communities um, throughout this country in the event that um, this is something that people might be hearing for the first time or something that they might not be that familiar with. So extreme risk protection orders are a civil court order that allows for the temporary removal of firearms when someone is behaving dangerously and at risk of committing violence either towards someone else or towards themselves. So they can be used when suicide is a risk as well. And the way these work is that once uh, someone is identified again as behaving dangerously and at risk of violence, um, a person can go to a courthouse, complete a petition, and request that um, they be heard before a judge with regard to the risks that they are seeing with regard to a particular individual. So upon submitting or filing this petition, um, a judge will hear the petitioner um, in that case, listen to their story, listen to their concerns about why an extreme risk protection order and a temporarily temporary prohibition on gun purchase and possession might be in order and make a decision um, right there in the hearing as to whether or not to issue that extreme risk protection order. If a judge issues that order, that order is then served. And ideally, firearms, any firearms that are in position, possession of the respondent are removed at the point of service. That petition, once it's served, also includes a date for a second hearing in which both the person who submitted that petition and the respondent to that petition would come back to the court and there would be an opportunity for both parties to be heard and the judge to decide whether or not to continue that extreme risk protection order for um, some additional time based on the testimony from both parties. So again, this is a process that exists um, in now 21 states in the District of Columbia. And it's a process that um, we know has been implemented differently in different states and within jurisdictions um, that within states that have these orders. So I'm involved with several studies that are looking at the implementation of extreme risk protection orders And um, as we look at how implementation is happening, there's a number of things that are becoming clear as we see the data that are important to to sort of know in terms of how best to ensure that these orders are used in a way that's gonna maximize their safety potential for the people involved. Um, And many of those lessons we take from our experience with domestic violence restraining orders. So first and foremost, when we look at the data with regard to extreme risk protection orders, what we see is there's tremendous variation across the states that have these laws in place, and there's tremendous variation among jurisdictions within uh, states where these laws exist. So just to give you an idea, um, we have states where there are jurisdictions where no um, extreme risk protection orders have been issued, and they may be existing alongside jurisdictions where hundreds of extreme risk protection orders have been issued. Um, We have states where um, extreme risk protection order laws have been in place for years, and there might be a couple of hundred that have been issued. We have states like Florida where they have also had extreme risk protection order laws in place for a couple of years. And best estimates are that about 10,000 have probably been issued at this point. 
So tremendous variation across and within states with regard to how um, often these are being used. Um, and we suspect with regard to how, um, how they are being enforced. So when we look at extreme risk protection order laws and ask questions with regard to implementation, there's tremendous potential to really improve and be strategic about the implementation process when it comes to ensuring the maximum benefits that um, are potentially um, feasible through these laws. And there's a couple things that we've learned from implementation of these types of laws um, that I wanna sort of focus on and share with you all, and that apply both to domestic violence restraining order laws as well as extreme risk protection order laws. So one of the things um, that we know is that it's important with regard to these kinds of laws um, to make sure that, um, that there are that there is an infrastructure in place to support implementation of these types of laws, which, um, which facilitate and allow for gun dispossession. So that infrastructure really um, is a criminal justice infrastructure by and large, so making sure that the courts are prepared to hear these cases, making sure that judges are aware of um, that these laws exist and sort of the criteria for deciding them, making sure that law enforcement who serve these orders are aware of these orders and how to successfully um, effectuate gun dispossession when they are serving these orders. Um, we also see that um, in when we look across states, when we look across um, jurisdictions where these laws are being implemented, we also we see a tremendous um, uh, effect when there are what we call champions for implementation, be they for domestic violence restraining orders or extreme risk protection orders. So what we've learned from studies of implementation of these gun dispossession provisions is that it really makes a difference if there is someone on the ground who sees the potential of these laws to improve community safety and really takes the steps to make sure that the infrastructure is in place, make sure that the people who are involved with implementing these laws um, are knowledgeable and prepared to use these laws when cases come before them and they could potentially be beneficial. At our center, we've done a number of things to really promote implementation. And I would say that uh, as we look at what can be done with regard to maximizing the impacts of domestic violence restraining orders or extreme risk protection orders, um, there's a number of things that I hope people at this meeting today will take away. Um, one is that implementation really matters. Um, you know, these laws are not self-executing. And so to undertake efforts to make sure, again, that people who are on the front lines of responding when people are in crisis um, are on the front lines of implementing extreme risk protection orders and domestic violence protection orders, that they're aware of these laws and that they know these tools exist and how to use these tools when they could benefit the people that they're working with. So the importance of assuring that those frontline crisis responders, be they law enforcement, be they clinicians, um, be they family members who are um, routinely dealing with um, loved ones who are in crisis, making sure that there is an awareness of these laws and that these can be put into play when the crisis allows is really important. We also see great benefit um, from specialized units that focus on implementation, that are trained and staffed to do implementation around these laws, um, be they implementation of domestic violence restraining orders or extreme risk protection orders. So there are specialized units that exist in places like King County, Washington, which is where Seattle is located, where there are people who are sort of the go-to people, if you will, um, to handle these kinds of extreme risk protection order or domestic violence restraining order cases um, that, are, that are trained in how to talk with people and how to work with people around gun dispossession. Those kinds of specialized units are extremely important. 
And as we look ahead, the kinds of infrastructure um, supports that are really needed in order to realize the types of implementation processes that are really needed in order to support these laws are increasingly becoming feasible. Um, this is a really exciting time in our country because um, arguably we are recognizing the importance of implementation and devoting resources to it in a way that we really haven't um, in the gun violence prevention space for as long as I've been working in the, on this issue. So last summer, President Biden signed the Bipartisan Community Safer Communities Act into law, and that act has within it funds from the federal government that are dedicated to support implementation of extreme risk protection orders. But that um, act also has support for a training and technical assistance center, which is run out of our um, School of Public Health uh, in Baltimore. So there is now funding and support and dedicated efforts to support implementation of extreme risk protection orders. And those lessons learned, what we're doing in that space has tremendous implications, not just for extreme risk protection orders, but also for the implementation of firearm prohibitions uh, with domestic violence restraining orders. So as I look at the landscape of implementation of extreme risk protection orders, of domestic violence protection orders as they relate to gun dispossession, I'm extremely excited for what the future holds, what actions are taking place, what research is being conducted right now, and how we can learn from all of this to ensure that moving forward, we maximize the impact of these laws on the books um, to realize greater benefits for women, partners who experience violence, and communities at large. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Wendy for our next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fratioli, uh from the School of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins School of uh, Public uh, Health. So our uh, final presenter is Dr. Ava uh, Carcereri, and she's the Director of Special Court Programs for Delaware Family Court. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you again for having me. Um, so I'm going to finish us up with um, a really kind of boots on the ground perspective of what we've been talking about today. Um, this is kind of fitting in perfectly with the previous speaker because we're gonna talk about Delaware's law on the books versus how we implement those laws. Um, hopefully you all aren't too horrified by how we kind of had to cobble some things together to implement our uh, firearm relinquishment laws. Um, but just as an FYI for those who may not know Delaware very much, um, we are a statewide court, so Delaware is very tiny. Uh, we have three counties. We have two rural counties and one, um, our most populated urban county in the north. Um, we have three family courts, and they all operate under the same statute and under the same policies. So when I kind of talk about what happens, this isn't what happens um, in family court statewide. We do have uh, laws at the state level uh, for firearm relinquishment within our, our protection orders. Um, we also have a couple other things that I wanted to mention, especially for the uh, policy people who are listening to uh, who are listening to this and who may um, want to take things back to their jurisdictions. I think the most important things in terms of the uh, statutes that we have is not only do we require relinquishment, we specify uh, time frames for that. so respondents, or the people that have the orders against them. Um, once they are served with their order, they have 48 hours to relinquish their firearms. We also have the ability to bring people back into the court. So the court can file, and I can go, I'll go into this in a little more detail, but for the statute uh, purposes, we can bring people back in if they are not compliant. And uh, Delaware can also issue writs for firearm relinquishment. And I'll go into that a little bit as well. But all of those things are very important in giving the court the authority that it needs to hold people accountable. So um, I'm going to go uh, into not too much detail. I know I only have uh, 15 minutes, but I wanna talk through what happens when a victim um, files for, for a protection order and how um, we track and ensure that guns are relinquished. 
So when a victim comes into file uh, for their civil protection order, if that uh, victim knows that the respondent has firearms, um, our judges and commissioners ask them the make and model, how many, um, you know, any details that they can get, that is then outlined in the order. Um, our staff are able to look at each uh, protection order each week and document all of the cases in which a firearm has been mentioned. Um, then we use very fancy technology. Um, and by fancy, I mean, we have an Excel, uh, an Excel spreadsheet that we use um, that automatically calculates uh, the 48 hour window and automatically calculates the service of the petition. So obviously if you have not been served with an order, um, we can't enforce it, but um, we do track for service. And as soon as the respondent is served with an order, that's when the clock starts. Um, the court has access to the police mainframe and within that 48 hour period, our staff can go um, check in that mainframe to see if the respondent has relinquished their protection order or their firearms. Um, all of our police agencies are equipped to take them. Uh, so we do have a really good partnership with our police agencies and our orders also note um, the closest agency to the respondent's home. So we are able to, as the court, not only tell them you know, when they need to relinquish their firearms, but where they can do so, the closest location. Um, we do have the option as well to um, have the respondent return their firearms to a, a licensed dealer. So that is an option that we offer as well. Um, if we do our, if we are provided with the receipt of the, the relinquishment, um, then the case proceeds as normal, um, with hearings and, you know, um, it kind of proceeds through the court. Um, if we do not have a receipt of the firearm relinquishment, um, the court can then issue what we call a rule to show cause, but that's really kind of an internal contempt um, filing against the respondent. The victim is then notified, um, but that victim does not have to appear for any of the cases for, for that hearing. So if the court brings a respondent to uh, back into court for a contempt hearing, that victim does not have to appear. Um, and so that's kind of our way of not only providing accountability, um, but also keeping an extra eye on respondents who are known to have weapons and have not relinquished them. Um, so while that law gives us that necessary authority, it's really up to the court um, to kind of build that infrastructure to enact it. So there are jurisdictions that do have relinquishment laws, but may not have the partnership with the police agencies, may not have the communication between the two. Um, so Delaware really uh, worked pretty hard to establish that rapport and establish um, the way that we can adequately ensure that firearms are relinquished in a timely manner um, once these orders are filed. So a few other issues that we've had, um, and I think this is particularly relevant to our previous speakers who were talking about the the, the current climate, um, you know, we are having a lot more respondents that um, are stockpiling weapons. Um, this is a, something that we saw pretty infrequently, but over the past couple of years, we've had concerns and we've had instances where, you know, there are hoarding weapons. They are very um, adamant that they do not want to relinquish their weapons. And so that's where the writs come in. So Delaware is able to issue a writ um, which is essentially an order for the police officer to go get the firearms. And so um, that's a little bit more of a process. So we don't issue them a lot um, because it requires a lot of coordination with our police agencies. Um, and as Dr. Shannon mentioned, we do have our, our kind of champions in this. So we have our police, a few pol police officers that really are on board with this process. They know who to go to, they know how to organize. Um, and so in an instance where a, a domestic violence victim is before the court and she um, explains that 
you know, there are a lot of weapons and this person does not want to relinquish them. And, um, you know, that fear level is, is increased. That commissioner then orders a writ from the bench. And, um, in most cases, firearms are collected, uh, within that 48 hour time span, um, usually by a team of police officers. Um, and so I think that as firearms become more prolific, we're going to see more respondents who are stockpiling, who are reluctant to follow court orders. Um, obviously, this escalates violence. This could escalate that fear level. Um, and our ability to issue writs are really critical in these instances where we need to do something immediately to grant that immediate safety to the victim. One other thing that I would like to mention as well um, especially for policy uh, makers, um, because this has been something that's come up over the past few years. Um, we have not seen this uh, level of distrust in the court system, um, at least since I've been, you know, working in the court system. But we have also had new cases pop up where uh, respondents will try to buy guns after having an order placed on them. And so that's not to say that that has never happened, but we as the court have started getting alerts um, from our federal database that a respondent has tried to purchase a firearm despite having an order against them where they know that they're not supposed to have a firearm. And so again, we're seeing that escalation of violence, we're seeing extremely concerning behaviors um, with somebody who does have an order against them. So they have either been um, found to have been uh, abusive to their partner, or they have consented um, to that order and yet are still purchasing weapons. And so I would want to mention that in this instance, the court does not have the authority to bring that person in. We only have the authority to bring people in to relinquish their initial named weapons. Um, but if they later go and try to purchase a weapon in another state, um, or even in our own state, family court can't uh, bring that person in. So what Delaware is doing now to kind of try to remedy that situation is we are working with our Department of Justice to um, try to hold these respondents accountable and try to ensure that um, there is some mechanism for um, making sure that respondents who do try to purchase firearms um, do see some kind of consequence for violating that court order. Um, so really all of this to say is that, um, implementation really necessitates a good working relationship with state agencies. Delaware is very tiny. We're lucky in that way because, um, we, you know, we can bring people to the table when we need to. Um, we're also very lucky in that we are statewide, so we don't, uh, have issues, as in, um, we don't have other states kind of issues where each county, you know, or each jurisdiction may operate wildly differently. Um, but I think that Delaware can be used as a good example uh, with regards to increasing accountability. Um, it's a good case study in what implementation actually looks like, especially, you know, I remember being in grad school and thinking kind of high level, research level, and policy level it is really difficult to kind of get out of that mindset and really think about, okay, so what we know what we want the overarching goal is with this policy. We know what we want to do with this, but how are we going to make sure that states can actually um, follow this or how can we actually make sure that this gets done? And I think that there are a lot of moving pieces and um, coordination between policymakers and courts and advocates and, um, and researchers, you know, it's really critical to ensuring that a law is implemented well, um, and it's, it's actually going to do what it's intended to do. Um, so I, I think I've rambled enough. I tried to make it a little short cause, uh, I, I know that we have a question and answer session. Um, I look forward to some great discussion. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Uh, Carthuri, uh, for that uh, presentation from the Special Court Programs for Delaware Family Court.
So I'll, I'll kick off our q and I really want to encourage those of you who are on the Zoom. You know, you can write the question in the chat. You can raise your hand. I'll be looking for that. Um, I have it all, I have my screen all set up. But let's start with um, um, Dr. Falindra. Uh, I'd like to ask you, I have multiple questions for the presenters, but I'll hold off and just ask one for each and see where we are. Uh, so what accounts uh, for the disconnect? between what you're finding in your uh, survey experiments and what you found in other work uh, with more uh, sort of broader survey polling uh, on the public desire for greater restrictions on guns in public places, for example, and in other ways, um, you know, certain uh, limitations or bans on certain kinds of weapons. And now what we're seeing with the adoption of particular gun laws loosening a lot of restrictions across states, that there seems to be a pretty strong disconnect and can you speculate on why you think public opinion is not really translating, uh, at least majority public opinion is not really translating into policy? There is an asymmetric commitment to advocacy from the part of the two publics. The <clears throat> gun rights um, proponents are very, very well organized and uh, part of a very tight knit community um, of gun culture. Uh, and uh, they're very, they have been trained for uh, six decades to be responsive to the various threats that come from, uh, from government in terms of uh, new efforts to restrict regulation for restrictive regulations. Um, and they're also very, very uh, likely to vote. So the, they're Older white men have resources, participate a lot, and they're more likely to vote. Therefore, they command a lot more um, attention from policymakers. On the other side, um, the the movement for uh, gun regulation and for uh, violence prevention hasn't found. Um, such a strong community has not been able to develop an equally strong uh, support. It's not that people don't support restrictions and they don't want to see lower levels of violence, but their identities are not tied to this issue and they commit their resources to other issues that are more important to them. And it's more difficult to motivate people to call their legislator and senator and whoever on behalf of gun rights, unless it is around a very visible instance of a shooting, something major happens. And now it's happening every day. It's really important to thank you so much for that response. It's really important to think about the intensity of preferences here and how uh, gun rights has become identity politics. Uh, whereas people who are advocating for sensible gun limitations or sensible gun restrictions may have a number of issues they care about. And so it would be less likely for them to you know, subsume that into an, a total identity. So it's just a really interesting uh, uh, take on our, our disconnect really between what we see in the polling and what we see uh, state legislatures doing. Dr. Frateroli, um, I have, again, several questions, but uh, I, I want to do two things. One is uh, make a two-part question here. What's the, first of, what's the average length of a, an extreme risk protection order in terms of time? Is it two weeks? Is it three weeks? Is it four weeks? Do we have data on the average length is? And second, um, uh, and this will probably also be for Dr. Uh, Carceri as well, when we're thinking about how we enforce this these laws um is there uh, accountability for the danger posed to law enforcement um in terms of carrying out an extreme uh, risk pr protection order yeah so in terms of the length of these orders uh, so you might remember that uh, i described the process that in most states is a two-stage process um so that temporary order is issued 
um, really with the respondent providing or with the petitioner providing testimony in the absence of the respondent, that's a short term uh, order that um, lasts, depending on the state, between seven days here in Maryland um, to up to usually about a month. Um, so that's uh, by statute how long those first stage orders are. What we see when we look at those um, orders, sometimes they are extending longer um, than that period because sometimes it just takes a bit of time to get people into the court. Um, then that second stage order is a little bit more standardized. Um, for the most part, states with extreme risk protection order laws on the books allow for that um, order to, uh, at the second stage, last for about a year. So California recently um, extended their, their law or amended their law to allow for up to five years um, for an extreme risk protection order, but most states are in the one year range of time. Yeah, and I would say with regard to your question about the safety of officers who do this kind of work, again, I would lean into the real importance of these specially trained units that we're seeing coming up in, um, in an increasing number of jurisdictions. So making sure that officers who are doing this work are trained in how to communicate and how to um, you know, best prepare themselves to have these conversations with people who they are disarming is a really important aspect of this work that is important for both the safety of people on the scene as well as the officers themselves. Um, and, and I'll say we did work, I, I did work with Garen Wintemute a, a number of years ago, probably 15 years ago, around service of domestic violence restraining orders. And this, um, you know, what we found from officers who seem to do this work well is that they they did what they described as sort of talking people out of their guns, right? Very uh, conversational, not confrontational. They go in um, unmarked cars, plain clothes, and really have a conversation with people about, you know, the need to comply with these orders and um, their availability to facilitate that process. So um, we do have um, we do have research on the books that helps inform these um, processes, uh, and for many people, it's not the kind of approach that immediately comes to mind when you think about removing guns from people who are dangerous and oftentimes violent. So following up on that, that's a perfect uh, uh, segue um, uh, to, talk, uh, to Dr. Garcieri about uh, the processes that Delaware employs. And uh, first of all, very uh, sort of basic question, how is the respondent notified? Are they notified in advance or is it just when the order is served? That's one question. Uh, and second, um, how do you actually keep track of the people that you are, uh, are, are watching or people that have been named uh, in, a, in a protection order request? as having a gun. I mean, how do you, I know it's a small state. I come from Rhode Island. That's a small state as well. Um, is there the man, not the, I don't want to say manpower, is there actually the capable power, you know, infrastructure uh, in terms of law enforcement to do this job? Uh, and again, the same question, what protocols are in place in Delaware to ensure the safety of law enforcement as they try to uh, secure this gun relinquishment or gun surrender? Yeah. So, um, that was one of the, actually the manpower um, argument was a sticking point with law enforcement as we were kind of getting this law implemented. Um, so if for those uh, jurisdictions that are having issues or are seeing pushback from law enforcement, that's unfortunately very common uh, because that is one of the, and, and Delaware is also a red flag state. So that was, again, another point of contention because, you know, police officers don't know how many to expect. So um, you know, a lot of the police agencies were having concerns and questions about, you know, where would we keep all of these weapons? And, and so that is something that um, you might have to consider and, and try to kind of help them talk through. Um, in terms of how respondents are notified, so if a petitioner uh, applies for emergency protection, that respondent might not be there and oftentimes isn't. Um, and so there very well could be an instance where, um, you know, she will ask for emergency protection. She will let the commissioner know that um, she does know that he has access to firearms or has has firearms. 
And that usually starts that process of relinquishment. So um, in the order itself, in the emergency order, um, it will say that there have been firearms named to relinquish. And that is when um, our court sends out for personal service. So they do, um, they are served by an officer um, who's contracted to serve orders. Um, oftentimes, uh, and this is happening across, you know, courts nationwide, we have a lot of issues with serving people, um, either because, uh, they are trans, you know, we're dealing with transient populations who move around a lot. We're dealing with people who may actively being avoiding service. Um, but we do attempt to serve them personally. Um, and usually it is, uh, one or two, um, people who are serving this PFA to the respondent. At that point, um, they are letting them know that they do have to relinquish their firearms and they have 48 hours to do so. That service is then entered into our mainframe system, our computer-based system, where our staff can then track service. So they will um, note that a relinquishment order was issued. Um, and then once they have that service date, they plug it into their fancy Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then they're able to see what day they are supposed to have turned in their weapons. And so on that day, they are then able to go into their mainframe again. There's an area that is shared with the police officers. And if a respondent does relinquish uh, their weapons to the police agency, that police officer then in their system will type out the date that it was relinquished, what was relinquished, including the firearm, make, model, um, the type of ammunition, um, anything that was relinquished um, will go into that system. And then that way our staff can see what has been turned in. There are sometimes instances where um, you know, a victim will mention, for example, that he has two firearms, and then we will see that only one has been relinquished. So that information um, is then communicated to the commissioner who then can ask at the next hearing, you know, what happened to the, you know, this other firearm, do you no longer have access to it? And so it's kind of a, a rolling kind of tracking process throughout the civil protection order. Um, as Dr. Frateroli said, um, it's kind of a, there's like an emergency petition part where there's like a short term order that's, you know, up to 15 days. And then the final hearing um, is when they usually confirm that the, the respondent doesn't have firearms. Um, but really, if, you know, once that final hearing is confirmed, um, we do stop tracking um, unless we get a notification that that person has tried to uh, purchase a different firearm. But really, once we have the the firearms either in the police agency or sometimes um, respondents will will put on the record that they no longer have it um, or they, you know, it was a friend's and that friend has it. The testimony will be good enough for the court's purposes um, as relinquishment as well. So it's at the beginning, we really try to kind of handle it at the beginning. Commissioners are always asking about firearms. They're always asking about possession at the beginning stages of those orders because that 48 hour turnaround time is pretty quick. And we do wanna make sure that we get firearms as soon as possible. Um, that being said, the writ process is kind of where the officer safety portion of your question comes in. So when commissioners issue writs, it's usually a several man operation or several, a, a unit is sent out. Um, and that is because of the elevated risk to, to police officers, um, especially if somebody is overtly, you know, refusing to relinquish or if they have many weapons. Um, so that team of officers usually has the, the equipment, the, the means to take, you know, many weapons. Um, and it is usually coordinated by our liaison who does have the training, the resources, and, you know, he's kind of the, the go-to person for that. Thank you. That's that's a great uh, a great uh, very uh, full response. Uh, we have a dialogue going on between two of our uh, 
our panelists, so I, I'd like to encourage them to share it. So we have a, a question and an answer, a question from Dr. Falindra for the, for the panel about Second Amendment sanctuary ordinances and, and how those laws at the local level, county level, um, they complicate red flag laws. And does, does a place with a sanctuary designation, does that mean that the law enforcement have publicly said they're not going to enforce these laws? Um, and so uh, if Dr. Fratteroli would like to respond, uh, she did in the chat, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so what I posted in the chat was a paper uh, out of Colorado where these Second Amendment sanctuary counties have really taken hold. Um, it's a paper led by Dr. Emmy Betts out of the University of Colorado. And, and what that shows is that while use of ERPO is uh, less common in sanctuary uh, communities compared to non-Second Amendment sanctuary counties, they are they are happening. ERPOs are being issued. And what I what I like to say whenever this um, comes up is that law enforcement um, certainly doesn't have a choice with regard to what kind of orders they serve. So if an order is issued by the court, um, I, it's it's not really there their option to decide that they're not going to enforce it. So it's a curious position, I think, that these communities have put their law enforcement in. Certainly we can uh, sort of see, and, and the data from Colorado bears this out, that there might be less of an inclination among law enforcement to actually use to use those ERPOs um, to be the petitioner when they come across a situation where someone is behaving dangerously at risk of violence. Um, they might be less inclined to use an ERPO um, but again, we do see in Colorado in particular, we have data to show that, that they are being used in counties that are you know, designated as Second Amendment sanctuary counties. And um, it'll be curious to see if, if a law enforcement officer says to the court, I'm not going to serve this order that you have, um, have issued uh, because that is their job. Uh, so I have a, a follow-up question for you uh, and Dr. Uh, Corsieri, and then I have another question for Dr. Falindra, as long as I don't see any other questions uh, among the audience. So here's the, uh, a simple question is, you mentioned ammunition. Um, so in Rhode Island, for example, we did have uh, someone who was stockpiling weapons, had more than 200 guns in a sort of a rural town on the outskirts of, of the state. And eventually um, the neighbors had complained about his firing of weapons. And then uh, and then the federal government had to come in with the state government to try to confiscate those weapons. And so that that has the way that protects. But we, uh, we've also adopted limitation on ammunition, ammunition possession generally and how many cartridges and how many bullets. And do, when you have an extreme risk protection order, does it always require the, the surrender of ammunition that goes with the weapon? Uh, and the second question is, can you clarify, maybe Dr. Fratelli or uh, both of you, each of you, what the difference is between a judge issuing a domestic violence protection order with a gun surrender provision and uh, an extreme risk protection order? Are they different things? Um, so maybe uh, Dr. Krasier can take the ammunition question and then Dr. Fratelli can take the other question. Sure. Um, so can you repeat the ammunition portion of the question? Yes. Yeah, so is it the case, is it the case in Delaware, for example, that when you have an extreme risk protection order for gun surrender or gun relinquishment, it does that require always that they surrender all yes. the ammunition that would go with that weapon? Yep. Um, so our statute, and that's for extreme risk and DV protection order, um, they do have to relinquish both the firearm and any ammunition. Um, and it is, um, and I, and you know, uh, Dr. Frateroli will elaborate, but they are two different things in that in, in Delaware, they're two different courts. So um, people will have very different experiences of, you know, how that process works. Um, even though it's kind of a high level procedurally similar and that there's an emergency procedure, emergency hearing portion, and then there's like the full hearing portion. Um, but our domestic violence protection orders allow for a much greater flexibility of other types of reliefs that can be offered. Um, so it's not just gun relinquishments, it's um, treatment, counseling, stay away order. So there's a whole bunch of, you know, custody visitation provisions that can be added into our um, domestic violence orders. And in Delaware, the, the extreme uh, risk protection orders are mainly focused on like the relinquishment of the firearms and that, and that kind of safety aspect. Okay. 
Yeah, just to, to echo that, um, that these are two different civil orders that um, are uh, domestic violence protection orders are available um, in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Extreme risk protection orders are currently available in 21 states and the District of Columbia. As of this week, Michigan became our 21st state to have an extreme risk protection order law. Um, they are two different processes. Um, ERPOs are very um, specifically focused on gun purchase and uh, possession prohibitions. Um, we do see in the data that sometimes uh, the, that partner violence uh, is oftentimes the impetus for extreme risk protection orders. We do see um, instances where some jurisdictions, um, people in jurisdictions are using both extreme risk protection orders and domestic violence restraining orders for the same case. Um, so it really, implementation looks very differently in places where both of these options exist. Um, one sort of challenge um, that really has risen up as we you know, focus a lot on implementation and gun dispossession under extreme risk protection orders is that, that um, domestic violence advocates have sort of long been advocated for greater implementation of the gun prohibition associated with domestic violence protection orders. And those calls have largely been falling on deaf ears. And so there's some tension that exists around well, with this um, increasing appreciation for the need to implement and enforce extreme risk protection order provisions, we also need to make sure that we are giving that same attention to domestic violence protection orders, particularly in places where extreme risk protection orders don't exist. Um, so, uh, you know, my greatest hope is that with the attention and scholarship that's happening around implementation of ERPOs, that that will also inform a much more diligent and and thorough implementation of the firearm prohibitions for domestic violence restraining orders as well. But two different types of orders, two different forms, and um, both don't exist in all 50 states. Um, I'm going to get to Dr. Uh, Rassian in one in one second. Just wanted to point out to exactly to your point in Michigan in, in uh, uh, the summer of 2022, a woman went to the court and asked for a domestic violence restraining order with a gun relinquishment or gun surrender provision, and that judge denied the order and uh, told her she had to file for divorce in order to get that kind of protection. And of course, she did file for divorce less than, I don't know, a week later, 10 days later. And very sadly, um, her um, estranged spouse um, had a gun, never had to relinquish the gun, and then um, went on uh, to murder his family. So it's it's uh, this is before that Michigan adopted um, extreme risk protection order. So you can see where the blanket of ERPO might help fill in those gaps in states where judges refuse to attach a gun relinquishment order. And it, it literally means life or death. So, uh, Dr. Rassian? Sorry, there are a lot of buttons on my screen. Um, I guess I would also say the other thing is, right, orders of protection are fundamentally about contact between the respondent and the petitioner, um, a, a victim of domestic abuse not wanting the respondent to contact them, which can be direct, indirect, et cetera. And, some states have the provision of gun prohibition and, and some don't. And, and that's not necessarily sort of standard with every protective order. Um, what's always interesting to me and gets to part of my question, though, is the federal government, the Gun Control Act of 1994 expansion, says that if there is a permanent order of protection, then that person is not to possess or purchase a firearm while that. Uh, full, typically a year, can be extended, but typically a year order of protection is in place. And this goes to a point um, that was made previously that domestic violence, um, folks in domestic violence relationships or that have these orders are typically very sort of transient. Uh, they move around a lot. That can be for the victim's safety. She may flee the state. There are a whole host of reasons. Um, and people just sometimes move. So uh, one question I have, um, especially in so for small states, right, where borders are, are just not that far, um, how 
in terms of implementation, how is sort of working with the federal government to enforce orders, um, both for orders of protection, and I have some experience with orders of protection, but I'm curious about how ERPO across state lines are being enforced or not being enforced, right? So orders of protection by the full faith and credit clause are enforceable across states. I imagine ERPOs are the same because they're a contract. Um, but I just, I, I'm curious to know, I haven't really thought about ERPOs and, and there was something, I don't know, that sparked the question. So I guess I'd first like to hear maybe from the Delaware perspective, if you, how you engage with uh, federal law enforcement to sort of bolster your enforcement and implementation efforts. And then also like to hear about how this conversation is unfolding in the ERPO landscape. Sure, um, so we do have a federal contact. Um, I have not in my memory um, an instance where we needed to call upon them for implementation, um, mostly because our police officers are pretty good about um, implementing our own um, gun relinquishment um, orders, but we also do have a procedure for adopting orders from other states. Um, our our dealers, um, you know, we use the NCI NCIC database, um, which I don't think all states use. Um, so, but we use it, and that is um, that is tremendously helpful for people that maybe want to come to Delaware to purchase a firearm because we do checks, um, and you know, if they are in the federal database, then we do not um, sell them orders and uh, sell them firearms and. Um, you know, we, our police officers, for the most part, are trained to, um, you know, follow orders that are brought in from other states as well. Um, because you're, you're right, we do have a lot of orders that come in from New Jersey, from PA, from Maryland. We also have, we also deal a lot with people who may move from one of those states to Delaware to file for a PO. And so um, we're very kind of used to figuring out little ways that we can um, make sure that we, we still get people the orders that they need um, while having that contact, that federal contact open. Yeah, and I would just add to that. So, so certainly federal law that um, prohibits uh, gun purchase and possession by domestic violence restraining order respondents that has been in place, as you say, for decades now, um, is an important protection that is under threat um, now, um, you know, based on some decisions that have come, um, uh, you know, come in recent months and that have cited the Bruin decision. Um, but the, the federal prohibition is really quite, um, you know, minimal and conservative, I would say, because as you, as you mentioned, it's for orders after hearing only. And so a lot of what we've seen with the few dozen states that have passed their own um, expansions of that federal law is to go beyond the order after hearing and to include the ex parte phase of the order, um, because we know that that's a phase during which um, petitioners or um, people facing violence are, are most at risk in partner violence situations. So um, the federal law is under threat right now in very real ways, which is something that we should all be following and aware of and advocating around. Um, but the state laws have really been um, more uh, progressive and expansive and responsive to what we know about the data. With regard to ERPO, uh, just because those laws have been in place for um, less amount of time, there isn't sort of the same um, established uh, reciprocity procedures. So there's a lot of variation that we see among states in terms of how those orders are handled. So Delaware is you know, one example. I think they, um, what you heard was a very good example of sort of recognizing the fluidity of state borders. But that's something that is on our list with our um, new Extreme Risk Protection Order Training and Technical Assistance Center to really get a handle on and support states in a way that can assure that orders that are issued in one state are recognized and enforced by others. But um, looking at the national landscape, I just don't think we're there yet. Um, so I think we're coming almost to a close of our panel, not quite yet. And so I thought it would be really uh, important to come back to Dr. Falindra's 
uh, uh, dimension of study in thinking about the connection between public opinion and um, sensible gun restrictions and sensible gun legislation. And when you think about extreme risk protection orders, and when you think about the fact that they, their scope tends to be uh, driven somewhat by domestic violence and intimate partner violence, but more more broad, what do you think it would take in terms of a public opinion campaign by advocates or supporters of extreme risk protection orders in some of these states that tend to be extreme, uh, extremely supportive of Second Amendment rights? Is there a way that advocates could message or couch these um, the ERPOs and domestic violence restraining orders in a way that would stand out, that, be, that would trigger something in respondents and public opinion that would say, OK, in that case, it's OK for the government to remove a weapon temporarily or remove a weapon for a longer period of time. Knowing, given your expertise on public opinion and the climate, where do you see it opening uh, for expanding the number of states that adopt ERPO and in general sort of reframing the idea of limitations on gun possessions to prevent intimate partner violence? So this is a very good question and uh, also the million dollar question. What I can tell you is that uh, approaches that message the costs of um, gun violence, whether they are mass shootings or dead children or dead wives, uh, are not going to be um, effective in mobilizing uh, people or dissuading um, those very strong gun rights advocates. So the challenge is how to um, make these uh, the messaging consistent with gun rights advocates' identities and what's important to them and sort of present it in a way that allows them to to continue to feel that their citizenship rights are not violated, who they are and their culture is not violated, while at the same time we're doing uh, something uh, for the public good. Uh, my data suggests that um, there is still a very strong uh, belief in social obligations in, uh, in the American public. So maybe leaning into that aspect of American identity and the fact that we are part of a society and we don't just have rights, we also have obligations. And a good citizen is somebody who also respects others and the rights of others. Um, maybe a campaign that sort of focuses on that aspect of social obligation of uh, that is also consistent with religious obligations that many religious ha religions have uh, may help uh, persuade or bring people, make people more comfortable uh, getting away from these extremist positions of any gun uh, legislation is a slippery slope, which will end up to tyranny. Um, well, I think that is an excellent summary and an excellent way to end uh, what I thought was just a terrific panel, uh, a great uh, framing, great expertise, uh, really important information as we continue the effort to bring uh, uh, scholars and practitioners and advocates from all from a lot of different fields to sort of draw much more attention to the costs of intimate partner violence, particularly with firearms, which continues to be an extreme uh, problem. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize Dr. Uh, Carrie Rassan. Yes, so thank you. I just wanted to um, add that this is our fourth and final uh, sort of series uh, or installment in this series. And one of the things that we're working on um, jointly with ARMS and the Talman Center are sort of a brief of each of the uh, panels, they're, they're all available with live stream, but we will distribute those to um, anyone who registered once they're ready and they'll be on our Twitter pages. So we hope that you continue to use these webinars in ways that make sense um, to expand their reach. And of course, thank you to um, our partners, uh, Wendy and Caitlin and Jen, who's who's my partner in many things, and today's panelists for, for taking part in this conversation today, but also the larger conversation over these past few months.
Thank you very much for attending. And please look for all of this information in brief and in language form on our social media outlets. And we will continue to be sending out these, uh, these webinars and these briefs consistently uh, to address this really crucial issue. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Wendy, for today's moderation. Thank you to our panelists.